beds and borders are possibly the key feature of any attractive garden. They're the place where we have all those lovely flowers and they give us so much joy. Um, but they're also places that can provide a massive amount for our garden wildlife. If we just carefully choose the plants that we put there um, to make sure we're providing for those, those core needs that we've talked about. So we've talked about food, water and shelter. We'll deal with water in a separate video, but food and shelter um, can be provided in a really big way um, into our beds and borders. So first of all, if we think about the most important insects for garden wildlife, which are those pollinating insects. So they're going to be food for some larger animals, but they're also, because they're pollinating our plants, um, they're the ones that also provide the fruit. They help our plants to make fruit later in the year. So let's um, think about those first of all, when we're planning out beds and borders. Um, and of course, looking after them means filling our beds with loads of really attractive flowers. So it's, it's a really great way, everybody wins. A um, really great way to provide for garden wildlife. So there's a, a handout beneath uh, this video. If you have a look down there, you can download a handout with all of my favorite plants for pollinators. The important thing to remember and what's included in that handout is to provide plants all year round, in particular from spring to autumn when insects are flying around. But I also like to provide some in the winter even. We do get some mild spells during the winter when some of our insects are waking up and it's worth making sure there's something for them to to feed from at that time of the year. So I've always got some primroses or um, some winter flowering viburnum, something like that, that um, the insects can feed on if they wake up during the winter months too. Um, another thing that you'll see in the handout is that I like to provide a wide diversity of different families, different plant families, because that way you're supporting a wider diversity of different types of insect. Um, and diversity always builds kind of resilience and strength into your system. Um, so if you think that the different, each different plant family has a, a particular sort of family trait, family type of flower shape. Um, so by providing different flower shapes, daisy flower shapes, as well as kind of mint family flower shapes, then you're providing for different types of insects that have different shapes of mouth part that can feed from those different types of flowers. Um, so have a look at that in the handout as well and notice the different types of flower shapes different um, families that are represented there and try and include a range of different families in your garden throughout the year. Um, I obviously go for single flowers rather than doubles um, because those are the ones that have actually got the nectar in and plants that have loads and loads of flowers on them. So um, think phlox or, or budlia. I've got a, a budlia bush behind me here. There's great big panicles covered in flowers, a, a sort of favorite for the butterflies and for the bees. These sorts of plants that are smothered in flowers look great in our flower beds. Um, they're really great for pollinating insects too, so long as you're going for those singles rather than the doubles. Um, so do have a look at that handout if you um, need to get any more plants into your beds for pollinators. Um, the other thing to think about when we're looking after our pollinating insects is remembering that their larval stage is very different to their adult stage and they need a different type of food. So larval stage for a lot of insects means caterpillars or grubs. Um, bees, of course, are already looked after. They get looked after in the hive by all the worker bees, bringing them back um, tasty treats to eat. But um, a lot of insects in the larval stage are fending for themselves and they're quite reliant on quite specific plants. A lot of our native insects are reliant on native plants to feed on. They've got quite delicate digestive systems. Um, so including natives in all the different areas of your garden is really worth doing. Not necessarily for the adult stage pollinating insects. You can um, go for it with whatever sort of plants that you can find that fit into those categories that I've talked about. Um, and as you'll see in the handout, there's all sorts of different plants in there from different parts of the world that we're quite familiar with in our gardens, but that aren't natives. But larval stages, it is worth thinking about natives. Um, they can be a bit tricky, I will be honest. In traditional beds and borders, we tend to like to keep them in some sense of an order. They tend to be a, a bit neater than perhaps um, a really kind of wild. We're going to talk about wild areas in, a, in another video. Um, beds and borders, it, it's nice to keep some sort of an order. So a lot of native plants do seed about quite prolifically. So when you're including them, just try and choose ones that can be easily weeded out and then it's not a problem. So foxgloves, wonderful, they seed everywhere. I can weed them out where I don't want them, I leave them where I do. Brilliant. Um, two plants that are really great for the larval stages of in an insect um, is the orange tip butterfly. 
is particularly easy to look after in your flower beds. This likes two very attractive native plants, honesty and um, hedge garlic or jack by the hedge. Honesty is a bit like a phlox, it's in the, the same family, it's in the cabbage family. It's got beautiful bright pink heads of flowers in the springtime and of course it's got those um, seed pods. You might be more familiar with the seed pods than you are with the flowers, those flat, they're like a sort of little moon, sort of silvery white um, seed pods um, all over through the winter time. But yeah, as I say, beautiful flowers. They grow quite tall and they're flowering in the springtime. So good to include at the back of a border. Weed them out from anywhere you don't want them. They're very easy to weed out or transplant them to somewhere else um, or give them to friends. They're really lovely plants. Um, and then the other one, as I said, is hedge garlic or jack by the hedge, which has um, beautiful, it's good in a slightly shady patch. So I'm sitting next to one of my slightly shady borders here. Um, and I do have it growing in this area. The leaves in the first year, it's a biennial, so the leaves come up in the first year and make a lovely rosette. And they're a bit like a branera, beautiful textured um, leaf. They look really lovely growing at the base of shrubs or trees. Um, it's good to have them at the backs of your borders because as I say, they do grow up fairly tall, again in the late spring. They're not terribly exciting flowers, but they're not unattractive. There's like a little white scattering of flower that will come up in the late spring in the backs of your borders. So I, I rather like to include that let that one seed around into my, my flower beds. Um, and it's edible, edible leaves taste like garlic, really good in a salad or in sandwiches. Um, so yeah, so you'll be looking after the orange tip butterflies larvae if you include those plants in your garden. And if you start to see more of them around, then you can feel all, all happy with yourself that you're helping to look after those really beautiful butterflies. Um, so we've provided a lot of food there for our garden insects. The other thing to think about, of course, is shelter. Um, and if you're careful with those plant choices, in particular for the ones that are flowering in the later part of the year, then you can provide some really fantastic winter stems um, that also add to the look of the garden through the winter, create a really beautiful winter garden. Um, so there's another handout for this, which includes plants that are my favorites for their winter stems. Um, and as I say, it's these sort of later summer flowering ones that it's easier to leave up. And you can leave spring flowering ones, like the honesty flowers at the end of the spring, you can leave that up, but just you have to be mindful that it's going to be there for a long time and you're going to probably have that summer flush of flowers coming up around it. So it's worth um, really going for the late summer flowers for your overwintering stems um, as a general rule. I've got a few in this part of the garden here. In my shady spot, I've got some acanthus. Maybe you can just about see there's a... Um, lovely big stem here from my um, acanthus plant. Um, elsewhere around here, I've, I've just pulled out some stems to show you. Um, I have some flomis, which is this lovely, can you see that okay? Beautiful seed heads. They're really, really um, distinctive shape and they all come kind of lined up on these on these lovely stems. This is one of the side stems. I didn't want to take one of the bigger ones off, but the, the main stems are lovely and fat to so make great winter stems. This is in the mint family and has some lovely big um, yellow, um, sort of those dragon head shaped flowers that you get on mint family plants that come in here in great sort of pom-poms. Um, really, really lovely plant. I've got sedums, of course, the sort of classic winter stem, really, really beautiful. This is a white flowering one, so it has um, quite a white stem in the winter, but the pinker flowering ones have darker stems. They can look really attractive, really lovely with the frost on them. Really nice winter stems. And just behind me, behind the, um, you can see the the bud layer behind me, just behind that, I've got some um, Japanese anemone, words fail me, Japanese anemone, um, which again, this is a little side shoot that has lovely big fat stems nearer to the bottom. But I rather like these little seed heads, they're like little white pom-poms, little white messy pom-poms. Um, if you leave them for long enough, the birds start pulling, f they make this wonderful fluff and the birds start pulling the fluff out of them to line their nests. Um, really lovely plant. A little bit messy, but I don't mind. I really love them. So those can stand up through the winter too. But do have a look at that handout. There are loads of suggestions in there for um, some really nice, neat um, winter stems that you can include to provide that habitat for overwintering insects. So again, so they've got a really nice head start into the springtime. Um, of course, the other good place for thinking about habitats, overwintering habitats, really the, the the best, well, the best, they're both good. But a really fantastic habitat, really fantastic thing to have in your garden is trees and shrubs. This is one of the best things you can do because they provide so much. They've got um, all sorts of crevices in the bark, um, 
the buddleia behind me, I don't know if you can see, but it's got really kind of gnarly bark and all sorts of insects can overwinter within the cracks in the bark um, or within the crevices between all the branches. They all make really great habitat for overwintering insects. And of course, being trees and shrubs, they're really big, so they've got lots of branches, um, lots of spots where birds can nest or um, perhaps they come right down to the ground and they've got a little space where um, ground nesting birds or um, ground foraging birds and animals can hang out and um, do all the things they need to do under there. So yeah, they provide fantastic habitat. Um, and of course, they can potentially provide all sorts of flowers too. They can be smothered in flowers and be providing for your pollinating insects along with all those perennials. Um, and they can even provide fruit for birds through the winter. Um, so sort of ornamental crab apples are a really good example. You've got those lovely blossom in the springtime and then really lovely crabs that sit on the tree right into the winter time to feed your birds and take a bit of pressure off from having to keep the bird feeders filled up. Um, so trees and chops are a really great addition. And from a design point of view, I love them because they create that lovely structure. You've got more three dimensionality to your beds, a bit more of a naturalistic look, um, a bit more interesting, just having a sort of range of different structures, heights, shapes and forms in your in your beds. Um, so it's a, it's a win-win situation. It's a really, really nice feature. Uh, of course, the other thing that trees and shrubs are really good at is um, providing leaves. You can probably see along the edge of this bed here, um, I've got all sorts of leaves. Where I'm sitting, I'm um, sitting overhung by my beautiful hazel tree, um, which has got lovely catkins on it right now. But it's also, um, it drops loads and loads of leaves. And I do collect them up off the paths on the whole and make them into leaf mould. But where they're getting into the beds, I let the leaves sit there and they provide a really good mulch. Um, they're protecting the soil, they're feeding um, those beneficial mycorrhizae, the fungal hyphae, which are, um, as we're all learning these days, are so beneficial for our plants um, and all sorts of other microbes, soil-based microbes that are also really beneficial for our plants and for the health of our soil and for the health of our system. Um, so yeah, trees and shrubs, I can't rave about them enough. It's really worth including them wherever you can um, in your beds and borders. So yeah, and just remember that to go for flowering ones, fruiting if you can, but do be careful with natives and do a bit of research to be sure that you're not going to be giving yourself lots of weeding to do because they will successfully, a lot of them successfully um, set seed and it can be a bit problematic. But we'll be talking about those in more detail in the video about the wild areas of your garden. Okay, so if you follow these tips and find lots of plants for pollinators, maybe put in some plants for those um, orange tip butterflies as well, and um, go for trees and shrubs wherever you can, then you'll be providing so much habitat and so much food for your garden wildlife. Um, it will be positively thriving just from your beds and borders.